now. On 105.9 FM and streaming worldwide on the WMAL app. O'Connor and Company. It's 7.06. It's O'Connor and Company. And boy, Julie Gunlock, you are. Remember when we first met and I asked what you would get if you won the lottery and what was your answer? Revenge. <laughs> You were expecting me to say some a boat, like a, a boat, house, a, a car, car an and I was island. Like, Let me think about this. Revenge. What would and you, you get fell if you out of your chair. Yes. You were laughing so and, hard. And now, yes. and now it's all coming home here. <laughs> the day before the election, accounts <sighs> will be settled. They will be. This is the day the Corleone family settles <laughs> all outstanding debts. <sighs> coming up in thirty minutes, Trevor Badditch will uh, reflect on the commander's commanding position now in the NFC East. 8.05, Sean Spicer will give us his final analysis of the electoral map. And then at 8.35, Anita Catchings, who was in that viral video out of Alexandria, where she got face-to-face with your typical white liberal. Yes. Woman. Woman. Yes. I was, I was, I'm restraining myself and allowing you to <laughs> take up the baton. <laughs> Joining us right now is Joe DeGeneva, legal analyst, former U.S. attorney for the District of Columbia, and a fan favorite here on this program. Good morning, Joe. We made it. It's election eve. It's election eve. Good morning, everybody, and uh, good morning, Julie. And, I wish you'd been in that uh, coffee well, shop, Joe. <laughs> yeah. Boy. Um, actually, actually I, I'm glad I wasn't there. I'm afraid I'm beyond the point of uh, interstellar grat- gratefulness for being confronted by idiots in the public square. Uh, this would be uh, it would be an, un- an unhappy ending for yeah. that woman. <laughs> If as, she got as, anywhere near my face, if she got anywhere near my face, she she would deeply regret it. Yes, yes. As they say, Joe DeGeneva has no more bleeps to give. <laughs> yes. Joe, right. um, first of all, buckle up and stick with us over a couple of segments because there's a lot going on right now, especially on the eve of the election. Let's start first uh, with your overall thoughts now uh, and your reflection on where we are uh, specifically. I think now at this point, the conversation pivots from the campaigns and their strategies and the last minute rallies and the undecideds. I think we're already sort of focusing on election integrity, the um, methods in securing and validating ballots and the counting of said ballots. Where do you think we are right now? Well, I think we're better off than we were in 2020. Uh, We we would be even uh, more better off uh, if it, if Ronna McDaniel had left earlier as the chairman of the Republican National Committee, as you know, in 2020, she had no ground game, no lawyers, was totally unprepared, and she contributed to the loss of Donald Trump in that campaign. She should have been replaced two years ago. Uh, she was replaced by Watley and Trump. And unfortunately, it wasn't soon enough. It was too late. But they've done a brilliant job of preparing a ground game, getting lawyers in. There have been hundreds of lawsuits filed uh, before the election to try and deal with specific issues and techniques of voting. But let me just say this. People must always remember this. Once the United States switched to mail-in balloting as a main form of voting, it was axiomatic that the amount of fraud would increase dramatically. And that's because mail-in ballot voting is the least secure a form of voting. That's why Democrats love it. That's why they want it. That's why they shove it down your throat. The best form of voting is early voting in person and voting on Election Day. Uh, Unfortunately, I think we're stuck with mail-in balloting, and it's going to take a major scandal to change the way mail-in balloting happens. But Mm. that's where we are. I mean, we're ready. We've got people on the ground. We've got lawyers ready to sue. But courts have proven repeatedly that they don't want to interfere and say that votes don't count because they don't like that power. Right. And and speaking of the reason why in-person voting is so important, first of all, because, um, well, the, the biggest reason is there are people watching at all times. There are election <laughs> monitors. It is a oh, live gosh. experience. Really? Right? <laughs> oh, gosh. Wow, it's harder to cheat. Exactly. And and that brings us to your new adopted home state of Florida, where the Justice Department wanted to send in federal election watchers down to Florida, which, I mean, that, that has there been some issue in Florida that we should know about? In fact, Florida, yeah. ever yeah, since the 2000 hanging chat, has been a great state. Yeah. And, and your governor has said, no, you're not welcome here. So what, what's this showdown looking like? 
this this was of course there was a problem in Florida. They were doing everything correctly. Yes, and, so and Republicans are winning. Merrick, Gar <laughs> Merrick Garland and his band of merry thugs from the Civil Rights Division and the Election Division wanted to create a fake crisis and say, well, we better send monitors to Florida because people are actually able to vote and bad people who shouldn't be voting, voting aren't voting. And that's because this Justice Department is a collection of people who don't worry about what the law is. They worry about the way they want to have outcomes occur. I, I just don't know how Merrick Garland gets up every morning other than through self-delusion <laughs> and believes that he's doing the right thing. This is a man who, remember, was just one short step away from the United States Supreme Court. Unfortunately, he ended up being attorney general and has done a lot more damage than he might have done as a justice. Although, thank God for Mitch McConnell's only great act as majority leader, keeping him off the court. Joe, meanwhile, in Georgia, and we are starting to see some of these election shenanigans uh, that we saw in 2020 as well. Um, in Georgia, uh, they've, they've said that they will accept, the Democrats have said that they will accept ballots after the early period has ended. Uh, apparently, the Republican Party in Georgia has now sued um, and and and, and ho hoping to stop that. Do you th have you reviewed this case? Do you think they have a chance at stopping this, which is, again, accepting ballots after the appropriate time set out by state law? Well, here's once again, Democrats, when they don't like the rules, they change them, yep. even if it's unconstitutional and illegal. Remember, under the Constitution, state legislatures write the rules for elections mm -hmm. and how they're conducted. Courts do not have the power, secretaries of state and boards of elections do not have the power to change the rules governing the counting of ballots. That's exactly what's going on in Georgia. They are violating the rules. It should be stopped by a court injunction. We'll see whether or not that happens. But this is the problem with mail-in ballots. Once again, there's no chain of custody that can ever be proven other than the signature and the date and the envelope. It's the worst form of voting. And the United States Commission on Voting said that many years ago. James Baker, Jimmy Carter all concluded it's the worst, most unsafe form of voting. We're speaking with Joe DeGeneva, legal analyst for the District of Columbia. Excuse me, legal analyst here and also former U.S. The attorney for the District of Columbia. legal analyst, by the way. <laughs> by the way, the district does need a legal analyst. Yes, <laughs> to say the least, which certainly does. Um, just in terms of the politics, we've got a couple of other issues we want to bring up with you, but just in our final minute of this segment, Joe, uh, based on the politics of it, how do you assess the campaigns right now in terms of their last-minute moves? Wait, we just noted that Bill Clinton is in New Hampshire, of all places, which seems like an expanded map. Yeah. For the Democrats, I don't think he's there because they are, you know, they, they've been in the driver's seat in New Hampshire. So that's got to be an indication that there's issues. And Donald Trump, by the way, came to Virginia over the weekend. What, what's your assessment here on where these things might uh, fall into place tomorrow night? Well, I think what's most disturbing are some of these late polls, like the one in Iowa that was ridiculous on its face about uh, Harris being up, I think, four to five points or some some, some ridiculous Insane. number. Yeah. Uh, when Trump is clearly ahead in Iowa, it's a state that's not going to flip Democratic. And what that means about polling and polling data, polling has become a weapon. Uh, it's, not a, it's not a way to get information anymore. It's become a weapon. And at the end of this season, uh, with a day before the election, a few days, that type of poll, I'm sorry, I don't care how respected this woman is who ran that poll. I can't remember her name, but I got to say something. Yeah. That, that poll was purposely wrong. That's, you just, it it's was, election the interference is what it is. Yeah. The, met, the methodology that was used is not sound. Hmm. And if she can stand up and say, oh, yes, it was all day long, that result is utterly ridiculous. As hmm. far as the general scheme of things, I think it's clearly pretty close because of the split between male and female, black and white. I think Trump is clearly going to pick up more black votes and more Hispanic votes. That's going to help him in certain key districts. I think, I think if I were a betting man, which I am, I would bet on Trump to win uh, the Electoral College. I think he's going to come very close, if not, in fact, take the, uh, the popular vote. Mm -hmm. But uh, 
given the degree of illegality that Democrats have been historically famous for, remember, the jokes about Cook County and Wheeling, West Virginia, aren't jokes because they weren't true. They're jokes because when Mayor Daley said, how many votes do you need uh, after the election was over? That's because there is corruption in those democratically controlled cities. Yeah. Whether federal courts like to hear that or not, that happens to be an, un, an absolutely verifiable truth. All right. Stay with us, Joe DeGeneva. we got some more questions for you. Thank you so much. 717 here on O'Connor and Company with Larry and Julie. And if any of you need a reminder as to why you tune in here to start your day and take us with you from your you know, alarm clock to your bathroom, to your kitchen, to your car, to your workplace, Not I want bathroom. you to understand. Hmm? Not the bathroom. Not the, Well, I no, mean, wait, wait. maybe just to, you know, maybe. brush your hair and teeth, sure. perhaps. Good. Yeah, we don't need that image. Uh, we want to remind you of how other people wake up and how they are greeted in the morning. Here's what the ABC audience gets from George Stephanopoulos. What we do know is this. No election since the Civil War has posed such a test of our constitutional system. Whether to accept election results and the peaceful transfer of power has never been on the ballot like this. The stakes in this election are as high as it gets. Joe, uh, is that how you, is, is this really, not since the Civil War has there been such a test of our constitutional well, system, whether to accept election results and the peaceful transfer of power has never been on the ballot like this. What are they signaling there, Joe? Poor George Stephanopoulos. Uh, he's, he's never gotten over Hillary's loss in 2016. <laughs> and every, er, everything that happens in politics is now an epic threat to the Constitution, all the while ignoring what Barack Obama and what Joe Biden and Kamala Harris have done to Donald Trump. Tried to destroy the man, use the FBI against him, the Department of Justice, pending indictments. Can you imagine any other politician? Just think about this. He's got pending cases in federal court in D.C. and Florida. He's got criminal cases in Georgia and in New York. And all you can hear from them is they're worried about him. These people are fundamentally really sick. Stephanopoulos, by the way, if you listen to him and you hear the tone of his voice, he actually believes what he is saying. This is a very disturbed I used, to, I used to say young man because he was so diminutive. He's now a very disturbed old man uh, who Little has old lost man. All, yes. all sense of, I mean, just the proportion. I mean, the guy's a nutcase. All you have to do is listen to that and listen to the tone of his voice. The, the only thing that's dangerous about this election is what the Democrats are doing, try to destroy it. That's yes. what's dangerous. Yes. That's what's the, and, and I'll tell you something. I said this the other night at a speech. When did the violence against Donald Trump start? And nobody, and then, you know, people give all quotes of you. I said, no, no, you're all wrong. Remember when Nancy Pelosi tore up the State of the Union address? Yep. Mm -hmm. That was the first act yep. of physical violence against Donald Trump. She should have been expelled from the House of Representatives. She has the gall to continue to be in that house. She'll be coming back. I will never forget that. I've just been waiting for the moment when I could see her in person and say, Madam Speaker, as, a for, as an Italian-American, I've never been more embarrassed, but you embarrass me more than Al Capone. Well, what's so funny, too, Joe, is that, that it obviously Stephanopoulos is talking about uh, Trump there, but it, there's only one party that's calling for the destruction of the Electoral College and destroying the court and unleashing lawfare against political opponents. So if you actually listen to that and in your mind go, maybe he's talking about Kamala, he's absolutely <laughs> right that we really are facing an election that does po pose a test to our constitutional... Was, unfortunately, he wasn't talking about that. I want to pivot over, though, to uh, the FCC... Um, the violation, the, the Harris campaign and SNL hosting Kamala right before the election, Saturday before the election. This is a violation of the S FCC rules, uh, the equal time rule. But will anything come of this, Joe? Will there actually be any cost uh, to Kamala for, for violating this rule? Well, well it's NBC. Actually, she didn't it's NBC. violate the rule. Yes, yes, but NBC. NBC issued a statement. This is how bad it was. They issued a statement, a corporate statement, admitting that they violated yep. the equal time rule. And they did it, the, uh, I think it was yesterday, they did it, uh, I'm, I'm not sure the exact timing of it, uh, but now is there enough time? Well, it doesn't matter. 
they're not going to give equal time to Donald Trump, right. even if he wanted it. And it wouldn't make any difference, although I think it would draw huge numbers of people. Uh, but <laughs> that was a disgraceful but purposeful act yes. by NBC News. They admitted that they knew they were breaking the equal time rule, and they did it anyway. Now, think about acting with impunity. When they talk about Donald Trump and fearing acting with impunity and being lawless, what could be more lawless? Then having a license that's granted by the federal government yeah. and saying, you know what, you guys aren't going to do anything to me. We're going to violate the law. And one of the most important doctrines in broadcasting is the equal time rule. Yeah. N networks, stations fear it, but not NBC, because they know that this administration will do nothing. You know, yeah. you know, if I were, I would punish NBC by not watching their programs anymore. I don't watch them anyway, but now I would watch them even less. I don't know how you do that physically. <laughs> But I wouldn't – and I certainly make their sponsors pay because that's the nature of our game. That's the kind of country we are. Jo Joe to Genova, we'll have to leave it there. It's always good to talk to you. But real fast, though, uh, one last question for you as a legal analyst and a political expert. One week from now, we will be speaking at this time. Will we know who the next president of the United States is by next Monday? No. Oh, Joe. Oh, Joe. Why would you leave uh, – oh. you know what? You know what? Fine. <laughs> Fine. Thank you, Joe. Thank hey, you. hey, don't blame me. Breaking our hearts. <laughs> breaking our hearts. Thanks, Joe DeGeneva. On 105.9 FM and streaming worldwide on the WMAL app. O'Connor and Company. It's 737. It's O'Connor and Company. It's election eve, and we got a lot to get to. Coming up at 8.05, Sean Spicer is going to give us his final analysis. He's going to go state by state. Well, I don't know if we can go state by state, but we'll talk about the, the borderline states, the... the uh, Battleground states with Sean Spicer. Then at 835, Annette Catchings, the woman who was facing the ire of that very angry Democrat who has 35 years of national security experience. <laughs> In that Alexandria coffee shop, that viral video we talked about earlier, Annette will give us her uh, immediate reaction coming up in a bit. That's Julie Gunlock right there. Good morning. I I'm Larry O'Connor, and let's get right to it with Trevor Maddich. Because Trevor... Uh, I, again, the Giants aren't a great team, but they're certainly better than the last time the Commanders faced them at home in Week Two, I believe it was. So I think I was sort of expecting the Giants to really bring it, but boy, I mean, the Commanders were in command, if I may say, of this game almost the entire time. They're real. They are definitely for real. They are definitely for real, Larry. And you're right; they were in command most of the game. There were a, a few. Uh, rough spots that they'll need to take care of, especially on defense, the commanders now. But they were up 21-7 at halftime. And so it was mostly a party for the fans until the fourth quarter when the Giants mounted a furious comeback and started to expose some of those those weaknesses that the commanders are going to have to fix. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jaden Dan is, I mean, you know, there was some concern about his bruised ribs. He had to leave the game early a couple of weeks ago. But my goodness, he's uh, he's playing like there's no problem. He's playing like not just rookie of the year. I mean, right now, sort of the consensus among analysts nationally is that Jaden Daniels is a lock to win rookie of the year. Now they're talking about MVP, hmm. like NFL MVP. And some of the other players that are being considered for that at this point of the season are Patrick Mahomes of the Chiefs, Josh Allen of the Bills, Lamar Jackson of the Ravens. And the last rookie to win Rookie of the Year was 1957 Jim Brown, Hall of Famer Jim Brown of the Cleveland Browns. Wow. And so, I mean, the way he's playing now is just, it transcends what rookie quarterbacks usually do. It transcends what quarterbacks typically do. He's being talked about in company with the elite of the elite. As you look at their schedule going forward, uh, you know, it's seven and two now. You've got the uh, second half of the season basically ahead of them. And it, it looks like it's the tougher part of the schedule. Would you agree? No, I absolutely agree. The schedule so far has given them a lot of runway to kind of get up to speed. And, you know, the toughest team they played was Baltimore who's got six wins right now, and Baltimore basically dominated that game in Baltimore against the Commanders. Mm -hmm. Well, now they've got Pittsburgh, who's got six wins. Then they've got at Philadelphia, who's got six wins. Yeah. So they'll have a chance now to prove once again that they do belong as a team with the best teams in the league. 
So next week against the Steelers, who do you think will be the starting quarterback, Justin Fields or Russell Wilson? Well, I trust Russell Wilson more. He's had a lot of, of issues in a lot of ways since he left uh, Seattle. Went to Denver, just failed miserably there. Now he's trying to restart it in in Pittsburgh. The, the difference is that Justin Fields, who was discarded essentially by Chicago after being, what, the number one pick in the draft or mm-hmm. one of the top picks in the draft, he he still hasn't proven he can be consistent. He's shown that he can have spectacular highlights, and in any one game, he can blow you away. But he also will make spectacular mistakes, whereas Russell Wilson has the savvy to be able to attack a defense on the level of the art of quarterbacking, not just the athletic ability to overpower you. So I would think they would play Russell Wilson, but at the same time, look at it this way. The commander's run defense is really struggling. It's one of the worst in the league. Mm. And when you talk about running, if you want a quarterback to contribute to that, then you're talking about Justin Fields. So it mm. could be either guy for different reasons, depending on what their game plan will be. Uh, we're speaking with Trevor Maddich about the Commanders game yesterday. And if you could, because you played in the NFL several seasons, and talk a little bit about the intangible here about a team believing in the system and feeling this momentum and the confidence. We haven't seen this from a Washington football team in quite some time after that miracle win against the Bears and now winning on the road against the Giants, a division rival that, that's, that's you know, both games now. They've swept the Giants. You, you heard this from some of the players in the locker room afterwards. Like, they believe every game they, they should win the game, and that starts to become infectious, right? And you start buying into what the coaches and the uh, offensive coordinator is telling you to do, and th- it all feeds upon itself, right? Yeah, that's a great point because there is a, a lot of magic that goes into creating momentum within an NFL football team, and, and it's because of the expectations. This, the concept of self-fulfilling prophecy is real on both sides. When Washington was just miserable and found new ways to lose week after week after week, it just became a self-fulfilling prophecy because right. if you go back to Dennis Waitley, Way back in the what, 50 or 60, 50s or 60s in his book, The Psychology of Winning, hmm. he says the mind cannot distinguish between reality and that which is vividly and repeatedly imagined. Hmm. Your primary narrative in your mind is where your body tends to take you. And so, I, I mean, I, I'll just use this example in college. I played at BYU. My quarterback, my four years were Jim McMahon, hmm. who became a Super Bowl champion, hmm. uh, or Mark Wilson first, then Jim McMahon, then Steve Young, Super Bowl champion, Hall of Famer, then Robbie Bosco, yeah. who was third in the uh, in the Heisman voting my senior year, and we won the national championship that year. And as a as a young player with Wilson and McMahon, and then with the other two guys, I personally and we as a team never thought we were ever out of a game. It's like. We're looking up at the scoreboard and the clock. We're going, okay, well, we have this much time to score that many points. No problem. Our quarterback is going to make it happen, and we need to support him. The commanders have that same belief in their quarterback, and they see him making almost magical throws from time to time when it's needed. You know, one of them was a touchdown at the end of the first half to Terry McLaurin. It was like an 18-yard touchdown pass. The defender was right in front of McLaurin, but looking at McLaurin, not the ball. The ball came right next to that defender's head. The defender was watching McLaurin's hands. When the hands started to come up, he would attack McLaurin. Well, McLaurin didn't put his hands up until the last instant. And so when that ball dropped in, the defender raised his hand, but he was just too late. The ball had cleared because McLaurin did not give him the, the cue by the raising his hand. Yeah. T- touchdown. And you know what? Daniels, the quarterback for the commander, said after the game that wasn't really a very good throw. It could have been better. Huh. Yeah, I mean, it, was just, it was just amazing. Yeah. And the team sees him. And that magic continues to grow because uh, of belief. This is this is a heady time right now. And you know my personal story, Trevor. I mean, my my two favorite teams are teams that have had some really rough times: the Commanders, uh, Skins, and the uh, and the Lions. And they're both playing like that. They're both playing like every game they're going to win it. And I'm worried about the collision they're about to face in the playoffs. But we'll get there when we get there. Trevor, always good. This is fun time to be a football fan, isn't it? 
Oh, and for the first time in a couple of decades, it's been <laughs> yeah. fun to be a Commanders fan. Thanks, man. Thanks, Thanks Trevor. Seven, actually, technically, first time in history to be fun to be a Commanders fan because back then we were Redskins fans. Ah, that's right. It was fun yes. when we were Redskins fans. I'm, I'm even becoming a bit of a fan. As well you should. <laughs> It's 745. So much truth, you'll hope for traffic so you can hear it all on the Vince Colony Show weekdays 3 to 6 right here on WMAL. Come on, is that not a vibe? So we play this not to sort of remind you of Austin Powers, although it does immediately yes. come to mind. It's to mourn the passing of Quincy Jones, an absolute American musical legend. And this song, let's hear a little bit more, it's this, in my mind, this perfectly captures who Quincy Jones is because you hear his music, you hear his creations, you hear his orchestrations, and it's just, it's more than just music. It's a vibe. It's, it's 60s a, cool. It's no, nothing more cool than this, yeah. right? And he worked with the greats. He worked with Sinatra. He worked with Burt Bacharach. He, I mean, he, that, that, and, he, and transcend genres. Jazz, course, obviously, yes. is where he came from. Got into pop music. In fact... If we could, uh, not only did he define that generation and that vibe and that sound uh, as an orchestra leader and conductor and director and musician, but then uh, as this musical genius, uh, as often musical geniuses do, he crossed over and transcended various genres and defined a whole new generation as a producer. When Michael Jackson left the Jackson 5 and started his own solo career in his first, you know, people, Thriller was just insane, like one of the biggest albums ever. Oh, do you still ever. remember that as a kid? Oh, of course. Are I you mean, kidding? I mean, I remember going to a, someone's house for a party to watch it. Oh, the, because, the video the that video. they made of it? The, oh, yes. Yeah. I mean, it was a huge deal. Well, but that album, too. Beyond oh, well, just course, that video, yeah. but that, uh, every song on that album was, was you know, multi, multi, multi platinum. Um, but it actually, Off the Wall was the first album that Michael Jackson went solo with. And it was Quincy Jones who sort of helped usher the Michael Jackson sound from the Jackson 5. Again, it's just, it's just a vibe. You hear, again, you don't only, not only hear this music and you like this music, but it immediately captures a generation. It captures an era. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And, and it was multiple eras that he wrote for. Uh, and you never found people saying bad things about him either. No, you know, I was, he was we were just talking act. about, I said, were there any scandals, especially in light of the P. Diddy, and not to bring up P. Diddy in at a time when we're talking about Quincy Jones, but when there are these scandals that come out of Hollywood and just yeah. this, these revealing things that are coming out of Hollywood, I don't think there ever was one with Quincy Jones. I think he was just a really upright guy. When you can capture a sound and, and make it, you know, blockbuster, internationally famous like Michael Jackson, and then three decades earlier, you know, capture. Oh, wow. You know you've got some genius going on there. Quincy Jones passed away overnight at the age of 91, and he truly was an American original. 753.